I am delighted to be here today. My name is Silvana Cisneros, and I'm the network's lead at the Wellbeing Project. I am very excited to be here since this is the first of a three-part webinar series, which will be an exploration of the topic of trauma in, collabor in collaboration with the Collective Change Lab. This is a subject that we have been exploring and researching through a think tank co-created with Georgetown University over the past three years. The launch of the research along with the executive summary came out actually last week. And we are very excited and it's all on our website at the Wellbeing Project. Many people and organizations have contributed to this work in the hopes that we can bring this topic to the mainstream, not only by creating awareness, but also finding practical ways to introduce this knowledge to our lives and our work. The hope is to center trauma at the heart of social change work and to bring healing to everyone who needs it. And I think we all need it. <laughs> um, today, we will be having a conversation with four wonderful human beings who have dedicated their lives to this meaningful and much needed work. I will introduce them briefly and try to do justice to these amazing humans that are with us today. Uh, first, Dr. Gail Christopher, who is the Executive Director of the National Collaborative for Health Equity and author of Racial Heating. She is the former Vice President of the Kellogg Foundation, where she served as visionary leader for the Foundation's 100 Million America Healing Initiatives and shaped their truth, racial healing, and transformation effort. Previously, Dr. Christopher served as the past executive director of the Institute for Government Innovation at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. We, have, we also have Dr. Tiang Ung, is the head of the Impact and Learning at Futures Without Violence and a licensed clinical social worker. She draws on decades of experience working in the child welfare and criminal justice systems, as well as in rape crisis centers, domestic violence shelters, and child and family trauma clinics to advance Futures' mission of ending violence against women and children. Prior to joining Futures, Tian was Director of Leadership Initiative and Programs at the Center of the Developing Child at Harvard University. Laura Calderón de la Barza is also part of the Collective Change Lab in addition to her affiliations with the Academy of Inner Science and the Pocket Project founded by Thomas Hubel. She is a psychotherapist specializing in collective trauma. She is also a collective healing researcher and educator. In addition to her private practice, she frequently offers workshops on healing for colonialism, from colonialism. And last but not least, our wonderful John Kania. He is the founder and executive director of the Collective Change Lab, a nonprofit lab for collaboration and the co-host of this webinar series on collective healing for systems change. For more than two decades, he has been a practitioner, researcher, writer, teacher, and speaker on how organizations and people can achieve change together. For much of that time, he served as managing director of FSG, a nonprofit consulting firm and think tank, where he co-authored seminal articles on, coll on collective impact and system change. Welcome to all our wonderful panelists and welcome to everyone today. Before we start, I want to make, take a few moments to convey a brief message of solidarity. At this moment, we would like to express our support for the many people experiencing deep trauma, fear, grief, who are directly or indirectly affected by the worsening humanitarian crisis currently taking place in Palestine, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, Sudan, Ukraine, and all over the world. We acknowledge this is a difficult time for many and we stand in solidarity with you. Please know that you are not alone. I will now leave you with our wonderful Laura Calderon de Barça, who will guide us in a centering exercise, who will hopefully help us arrive and be pre present throughout our time together. Thank you very much. You are in wonderful hands. Laura. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Silvana, for that warm welcome and welcome everybody uh, on my behalf as well. And um, today is a really exciting day for us as a, at the Collective Change Lab, as well as at the Wellbeing Project, as we begin sharing with you the results of our exploration of the worlds of trauma, healing, of collective healing in particular, and the worlds of system change. 
We're also delighted to have with us some of the wise and inspiring leaders that we have had the pleasure of being in conversation with. And one of the takeaways we got from our work is the clarity of how important it is to resource ourselves, to support ourselves as we engage in these conversations, which can at times be quite challenging. So with that in mind, we'll start our time today with an embodiment practice. So I invite you to take a moment to find a comfortable position for your body as you're sitting and uh, see if you can find your, your spine straight, but also relaxed. Take a moment for that. So once you're ready, I invite you to either close your eyes or to soften your gaze and take a deeper breath and go as deep as feels comfortable to you. And on the exhale, soften, bringing your attention to yourself, to your inner experience. Take another deeper conscious breath. And start to notice whatever sensations are present for you now. Whether you feel the flowing sensations of life in your body or the wave of movement of your breath. Or maybe you notice tension, maybe even pain or tiredness. Or perhaps you notice that part of your body feels numb. Whatever you might feel, I invite you to welcome your inner experience just as it is, without trying to change it or fix it. Now bring your attention back to your eyes. And, and I invite you again, even if you have your eyes closed, to soften your gaze. Soften the way you hold your eyes and see if you can bring kindness to the expression of your eyes. And notice what that, what that feels like. So allow your eyes to become kind. And now I invite you um, to allow your eyes to open. And for those of us who are visible, if we can share our kind eyes with each other as a welcome to this space. And then notice what it feels like to receive the kind gaze of others. And what that does to our space. Hmm. And I thank all of you who have opened uh, your your windows so that we can we can see and we can feel each other. Thank you so much. And um, take a moment now to feel how do you feel right now after this brief exercise that offers grounding and relating. And before we jump into our conversation, just a few words on participating today that I feel are good also for the rest of the series. We believe that these are very important conversations that we need to be present for. We therefore invite you to be mindful of your state, uh, of what you might be needing. Um, if you become uncomfortable, because these conversations can make us uncomfortable. If you do become uncomfortable, I invite you to use the slow practice. And uh, Tad, if you could put on the slide. So the slow practice involves Stopping, S for stopping or slowing down or pausing. T for taking a deeper breath, kind of like we just did. O for observing your inner state, noticing what's happening with your feelings, thoughts, sensations. And then practice spaciousness, that is allowing. So allow yourself to have your own experience and maybe allow other people to have their own experience too. Knowing that does not necessarily mean that you agree with them just that you're, you're allowing this, you're giving space. See if that makes a difference. If you can come back to being present, great, then I invite you to remain with us. However, if you notice, and you can take off the slide now, thank you, uh, Tad. If, however, if you notice that the state is not just one of discomfort, but that you can't stay present, then I invite you to take some time to take care of yourself. Maybe get up and stretch, maybe do some self-contact, or connect to nature, or simply take a moment for whatever supports you. As important as these conversations are, remember, they will be recorded, so you can always come back to them later. And although we have been conditioned to power through, today we invite you to give yourself the permission to look after yourself. And with that, 
Over to you, my dear John. Thank you, Laura. And thanks for that beautiful foundation for today's conversation. Indeed, all feelings belong and all emotions we have today are welcome. So hello to everyone and thank you all for joining us today and thank you to our wonderful panelists for being here. This is a conversation that promises to be both heavy and hopeful. And to begin, I'd like to provide a bit of an origin story to uh, this webinar series as a way to frame the conversation. For the last two years, we at the Collective Change Lab have been doing research on the topic of how to best support transformational change in communities. Now, a key finding from our work is that a critical factor that prevents communities and systems from transforming is trauma, and importantly, inattention to healing trauma as a part of the collective work. In fact, we believe that when communities feel stymied in making progress because systems feel stuck, a major, source, a major source of that stuckedness, the resistance, blockages, defensiveness, denial, is trauma that exists in the system and is left unresolved and unintegrated. We believe the converse is also true. To the degree that trauma in the system is resolved and integrated, healing can produce tremendous energy and creativity, bringing regeneration to communities and opening up new and untapped potential. What seems so incredibly difficult for systems and communities to get beyond can become easier. Yet by and large, our systems don't recognize how trauma impacts people. And as a result, decision makers in those systems can create trauma and they can hold people in a space of trauma. And if we don't talk about it and acknowledge it, then it's very difficult to bring about change. So we have to talk about it. We have to acknowledge it. But I think most of us, or at least many of us, feel ill-equipped to do that. Trauma is scary and complex, and it's like navigating a minefield. So today, through the dialogue with our panelists and all of you, we hope to do the following. First, offer important dimensions into the types of trauma that affect social change work. Trauma is an incredibly complex topic and understanding the different qualities of indiv indiv individual, intergenerational, collective, historical, and systemic trauma and how trauma manifests in organizations and systems we are working to change is an important starting point to this work. The second thing we'd like to do is share stories about how these different layers of trauma show up in social change. And thirdly, we want to explore the opportunity for collective healing to work as a part of systems change. But before turning to Gail and Tien and Laura, I want to turn to all of you who tuned in for this and ask you the question and please uh, put some thoughts. I invite you to put thoughts in the chat of what brought you to this webinar. becoming more trauma-informed, social determinants of health, the desire to address systemic trauma and help heal myself and the world. I wanna be part of this transformation. I'd like to learn more about this. How do, we, how do we use trauma work in peace building to have more awareness, the desire to better understand the impacts of trauma on my staff and connect to healing drawn to the intersection of systems change with historical trauma. Hmm. Trauma and collective change, systems change. What are learning tools? How do we go deeper in my grief, loss, and trauma work? Thank you for sharing that. Deepening my understanding about models of uh, effective collective healing. leading a systems change initiative that's actually addressing trauma. Convinced that healing is the path forward to creating more transformative change in our world, in our communities. Beautiful. Thank you all for sharing. Well, um, I'm gonna turn to our panelists at this point, and uh, I'm just so delighted uh, to have Gail and Tien and Laura here for this conversation today. Um, 
I've had the great benefit of knowing all three of them, and I've learned a lot from them, particularly around this topic of trauma. Um, so uh, I might start with a question for all three of you to answer. Um, and Tian, I'll start with you if that's okay. And the question is sort of what brought you to this work? Thank you, John, and thank you for having me. Welcome, everybody. I'm so pleased to be here. Um, what brought me to this work? Well, I, I often introduce myself as, a, as an academic in recovery. <laughs> so most of my adult life has been um, in the academy, um, but also I started earlier as a, a child and family trauma clinician um, in our child welfare system and in our sort of health and behavioral health systems. But, but that's not what brought me to this work, actually. What brought me to this work are was really my own experiences of trauma. I'm um, an adult now with um, an ACEs score of nine. For those of you who are not familiar and are calling in internationally, ACEs is known as um, adverse childhood experiences here in the US. And there are 10 that have been identified as key to um, sort of links in later life um, health and mental health issues. And so I had nine of those 10 growing up. Um, but really, I think what, what, what really drove me into this work was, was beyond the questions that I had as a child growing up that I was really looking for some answers for was that there wasn't, um, there wasn't sort of the solutions that really reflected my experiences or my family's experiences as survivors of trauma. Um, the solutions that I was trained on as a clinicians that I myself trained others on were really organized around um, a mental health frame and a behavioral health frame um, that, that, that focused very much on symptom management um, and behavior control um, and didn't really lift up the things that I knew in my life um, were what allows me to sort of be here today despite that ACEs score. Things like relationships and community and dignity and um, ethnic and, and, and identity affirmation. You know, our current responses, both in the health and medical um, ecosystems, are not organized around fostering those types of relationships. So I'll, I'll tell you a quick little story and then I'll move on because I, I really want to have some time for some conversations and let the other panelists introduce themselves as well. But you know, my family and I migrated here as Vietnamese refugees in 75 as Saigon was falling in April. And when we were, you know, pulled out of the refugee camps in Guam, um, the resettlement policy, and this 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 speaks to you know, the, the systemic and intergenerational trauma and the ways historical trauma is sort of cooked into our systems and the impact that it had on myself and my families. But the resettlement policy in the U.S. at that time was a policy that was organized around the idea of assimilation. And the underlying values of that policy were really about making sure that all Vietnamese refugees and their families did not become a burden on the welfare system um, and could sort of live on their own. Um, but what that meant is the, the practices of, of where our families got placed stripped myself and my families from any type of community and closeness and intimacy. You know, every family had to be placed at least within a 50 mile radius of one another. Um, and the impact of that had long standing effects on my family. And, you know, I remember as a child, you know, driving two or three times a year you know, four to six hours. We were placed in North Carolina. So I do have a little Southern twang if you catch me. <laughs> okay. um, but we would drive about six to eight hours from North Carolina, Charlotte, Fayetteville, North Carolina, all the way to um, Virginia, because that's where we could sort of find other Vietnamese families who would find other ways to get their, their, their hands on really common day things like spices, fish sauce, you know, or who were growing herbs. That's where we kind of came together in community and could sort of make meals um, and food that was familiar and, you know, share about sort of the, the hardships or the, the things that we were experiencing and have some sense of relief um, from, you know, the adversities of day to day. Um, but that idea that, you know, that, that I, 
and my family had to sort of prove ourselves in order to to be welcomed here you know that we had no assets to begin <laughs> to begin with is something that um permeated my entire childhood and that's that's not an old story that's a recurring one when we think about all of the immigrants and refugee families and children who are migrating to the U.S. today, that expectation is still there. You know, Laura started off our session today talking about, you know, thinking about how can we give ourselves resources and learn how to nurture ourselves, our spirits, our hearts, our souls, and each other, um, and opened up with this beautiful anchoring um, It's that type of mindset that is not cooked into the system as it's designed now. The mindset that was cooked in in 75 when I came here as a child and is still pervasive today is one in which, you know, people who look like me and families who are like me have to hustle. We have to prove ourselves. Um, We have to prove ourselves against all odds. We have to create a life for our children. That means that we have to make unbelievable trade-offs between food (laughs) right? Um, Mortgages or rents, transportation, um, um, or um, time with our children, you know? Um, And, and, you know, that's not okay. So that's what brought me to this work. The belief actually that we can on purpose and by design, just like we on purpose and by design created the experiences and conditions that affected my life and my family's life, we can actually on purpose and by design create better experiences and better conditions that I hope will impact my children's lives and their children's lives and disrupt that sort of transmission of um, trauma intergenerationally. That's actually handed down by the system, not by the families. Mm. That's an incredible story you tell and thank you for that. Um, and also for the asset orientation and I hope we can, we can come back to that. Um, Gail, uh, what brought you to the work? Thank you, John, and welcome everyone. And Kian, when I hear your story, I'm so touched by your clarity and your resilience. Uh, It's a beautiful story. You know, being an African-American woman in this country, the United States, uh, you could say that that brought me to this work, right? Uh, My parents were part of the the great migration of African-Americans from the South where they lived under violence and apartheid and all kinds of trauma to the Northern cities where they became exposed to the racism. And, but at the same time, opportunities that they never knew, you know, in the South. So, so I grew up with an acute awareness of that I was an African-American woman. I came of age during the 60s, Dr. King came and spoke at our high school. And, you know, it was during that era of of civil rights, right? So in that sense, my mindset was prepared for understanding that fighting for, you know, our full identity as human beings, for our full dignity was part of the inheritance of being an African-American in the United States. But I was blessed to to pursue a profession which has gained more mainstream recognition today, but in those decades, it was really, you know, alternative and that's being polite. You know, I'm a licensed napropath, naturopath and clinical nutritionist. And so most of my daily practice with thousands of, of patients was about stress management. It was about resilience. It was about looking at the body holistically and helping them to resource themselves in a holistic way so that they were less inclined to manifest what were called health disparities and now are called health inequities. So my worldview was shaped by my experience as a Black woman and some of the the tremendous losses Uh, that came along with that, as well as the opportunities that opened up in the 60s and an understanding that was really grounded in the respect for really the awe that I carry to this day of the human body and its capacity for healing. You know, we tend to, in our American system of, of care, particularly medical care, we tend to see the body as a harbinger of pathology and we tend to take a, 
a diagnostic pathological frame to the human body, not honoring its amazing, uh, awe-inspiring capacity for healing, which is the norm. It is not the exception. And so I'm so excited about this work because I think if we can bring that understanding into this work, that in fact, to heal is the is the norm. It is the expectation. And if we can design systems that promote and do not serve as barriers to that natural process. Uh, so, you know, my life's work started clinically on the south side of Chicago, and then it moved to designing social programs. And ultimately, it, I ended up, you know, working on policy change that would address the the social determinants. We call them the social determinants of health, but you know, in reality, we were focusing on most of the barriers that were socially determined, and you you would say systemically determined barriers to health. And then ultimately, I was privileged to be in philanthropy, where we were able to to I joined a, a philanthropic organization, the Kellogg Foundation, which really had as its motto trying to get money directly into local communities. And at the time, that organization was committed to being a very effective anti-racist organization, which we managed to transform into one that promoted racial equity and racial healing. So my journey goes through many, many decades, but it was grounded in the experience of an African-American woman, single parent, uh, who had lost her firstborn child, that statistic of infant mortality, and many other losses, but always with surrounded by a community that knew that it was up to us to prove the belief in our inferiority wrong and to assert our dignity and our deserving of equal opportunity and equal rights. And, and that's been the, the hallmark of my life. Uh, and so I guess that's my story. Um, yeah. Thank you, John, for the invitation. Thank you. Yeah, it's an amazing set of experiences. And thank you for bringing the body in. I think, you know, many of us are sort of uh, coming and coming into awareness about the importance of the body and the fact that it may be the quickest way to healing um, as opposed to sort of trying to do it all in the head. Um, so thank you for that. Laura, what brought you to the work? Um, thank you, John. First, I'd just like to take a moment to honor both of your journeys, Tian and Gail, and that I'd like so much wisdom that you have harnessed from that. And I love this, um, this agency orientation, what makes a difference and where is our resilience? And that's what we need to focus on. Um, in my case, I arrived both uh, because of the impacts of racism uh, that I experienced uh, growing up in um in an upper middle class environment and being a, a mestiza, a woman of both indigenous and Spanish roots in a society that has not healed from, from colonialism. And um, I started my healing journey when I was 18 and it was initially very focused on the individual. But I remember a moment where it actually shifted and became collective once I realized, wait a minute, Yes, I have a lot of things to heal from, but Mexico needs to heal also. You know, we have not finished accepting our indigenous roots with honor and respect. And so, you know, that's that's just like, it just became so clear to me that without that, my own healing was just incomplete. And so for my PhD thesis, I, I did that. I created a psychotherapeutic session for my country. Um, and that started an amazing collective journey that continues today because there's so much to learn about, you know, people who have had to face uh, um, oppression and um, and racism and colonial attitudes and, you know, that have for many costed them their lives and they have had to develop ways of dealing with this already for many centuries. So I really you know, a shout out and an honoring for indigenous communities, black communities, immigrant communities uh, who have needed to come together to find ways to resource themselves so that, you know, they could continue living and, and, and moving forward and not allowing all these horrific kinds of experiences to, to keep them even in spite of the grief and, and all the trauma. So, um, 
So I'm, I'm a humble student of that. And I've had the opportunity to learn with some amazing teachers. But I do have to say that the, the biggest teacher I have had has been my own healing journey. You know, learning, as Gail was saying, from the body, what it can do. You know, as Atien was saying, from communities, the, the difference that being in community and feeling belonging has, has had for me. So that's um, that's where... That's how I came to this work, my dear John. And actually, I also have a question for you because often people think that um, people who are in positions of privilege um, or, or do not deal with trauma themselves, particularly, you know, white men in positions of power. And I would love to invite you, could you kindly share with us some of what your experiences have been uh, in the work that we have done? What have you learned? What have you realized? Yeah, thanks for the question, Laura. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, we've been involved in this work for the last two years, and I would say I'm far from an expert. Uh, we're really looking at the intersection between trauma and systems change, but sort of two resonant experiences for me. One is sort of individual trauma that I had uh, as a child, and the second is sort of my version of, you know, um, intergenerational trauma. Um, and the individual experience was as a very young person, a very young child. Uh, I witnessed the accidental death of a friend. And, you know, that's sort of been a, a lifetime of sort of, of uh, working with that. And I've been very lucky in that I've been resourced to deal with that. Um, and uh, so that's certainly something that continues as an ongoing thing. I think the, you know, the intergenerational dimension is something that is actually very recently came into my awareness and it's been as a result of this work. And, um, you know, as we got deeper into the work, it, it literally just came into my consciousness that I have very little sort of knowledge of my ancestors. Uh, I can go back like one generation and that's it. And, you know, how unusual is that? And I'm told that particularly among white Europeans, uh, that that is often the case. It's not universal, but that is often the case. And, you know, I started to say, what are the, you know, what happens as a result? I think one thing for me, which is there's a certain numbness that I get, you know, sometimes when I'm looking to express emotions, uh, I sometimes feel like an outsider and that, you know, your mentor or spiritual sort of uh, teacher, Thomas Hubel calls it absencing. When I heard that word, I really sort of understood what's actually going on for me. And I don't, you know, it's, I don't want, it's not the same as sort of violence or, uh, psychological intergenerational trauma. Um, but for me, it's certainly something that I need to be aware of. Um, what I, as I've sort of explored it further, I think one of the things is particularly for white men, we need to be to the degree that we feel numb about this and to the degree that we're in uh, positions of privilege is, you know, we've got to make sure that we're not making decisions that sort of lack empathy and lack, uh, uh, lack compassion. And so, you know, it's something that's part of what I need to work on, what I am working on with my spiritual journey. And I'm also finding out more about uh, my ancestors um, to make that connection, you know, mm -hmm. more significant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question. So what we thought we'd do next is, uh, again, this is a very complex topic, uh, lots of different terms, you know, even, even here being thrown around. Uh, I'm going to ask Laura if you might just sort of do maybe an eight minute, you know, not justice, doing a justice uh, explanation of how to think about trauma uh, and just explain some of these terms that we're starting to use. And then we can then turn it back to, you know, the panelists and and uh, I'll ask them to sort of say, where, where are these different types of trauma showing up in your work? So, Laura, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, John. Uh, yes, and so yes, this is quite a complex topic. So I'll do my best to try to do that in eight minutes. Um, so we'll start with a definition of trauma. Uh, so it's not only a harmful event that happened in the past, it is an unhealed invisible wound from an overwhelming event, series of events or enduring conditions during our lifetime that remains as an active ongoing process inside of us even long after the event has passed. Trauma is therefore always in the room with us, either dormant or activated in our bodies, in our ways of being, in our ways of relating to each other. And you might wonder, how can the past stay active in us? 
let's turn for a moment to our nervous system uh, to look for some answers there. When we face danger or threat, our nervous system activates a protective response. If we're actually able to control the threat or escape it, we experience that this protective response was successful, and so it becomes extinguished. And then we don't carry any residue because there are no residue to carry. However, when we face significant danger and our bodies are unable to successfully complete a protective response, that is to, to keep us from having the impact of the overwhelming experience, that's when the past gets stuck in us. Why? Because when we're unable to prevent that impact, the task was not completed and we are left on alert with both the sense that the threat is still active and that the impulse to protect is ready to engage to try to finish the task of protecting that was left incomplete. So every time we come into a situation that is similar or in some way reminds us of the initial overwhelming event, the impulse to protect and the sense to uh, the sense of threat get reactivated. Um, let me then just take a moment because I have prepared a bit more material that I will would take uh, a bit longer. So uh, with these protective responses, there's three of them that we have been, um, most of us have heard about. Um, and I know that there's more, but you know, for those of you who are already trained in trauma, I'm just I'm going to try to keep them to the minimum here so that we can uh, make, make use of our time for our conversation more. So those three most common survival responses are the fight, uh, flight, and freeze responses. So we'll start first with fight. The essence of the fight response is to mobilize us to control or dominate what is perceived as dangerous. Examples of that are overreacting to minor infractions, shaming, or which means attribution of mistakes to character flaws, excessively harsh criticism, controlling behaviors such as hypervigilance, withholding information, or chronic unwarranted mistrust. Then the essence of the flight responses are to seek to evade or to distance ourselves from danger. Fragmentation is a very common one, and that is the disconnection of parts of us. Uh, for the mind, for example, that's to forget an overwhelming event. In terms of relating, fragmentation would look like to stop talking to somebody or, <clears throat> excuse me, other instances uh, of flight would be downplaying consequences, confusion and disorganization, not acknowledging an overwhelming reality, incoherence between words and action and, and dissociation. And in all these cases, the common thread is that there's some distancing with, with the object that is making us feel threat. Then the freeze response, uh, those responses are more nuanced, but their essence is immobility to preserve life. It occurs when you cannot resolve by fleeing or fighting, and you can consider it a kind of camouflage response. Uh, the main one is paralysis, but also withdrawal, numbness, insensitivity. When your will gets immobilized, uh, uh, you cannot make decisions, for example, feeling flat, disconnected, or unable to access your emotions. Now, a few important things regarding the intensity of these responses. As you can see from here, we all carry some degree of trauma, which does not mean that we all have post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. PTSD is a natural disorder with much more severe symptoms that impede our functioning in life and usually emerge from the combination of severe trauma and inadequate conditions and resources to deal with them. Trauma, on the other hand, when it's not excessively compounded, actually helps us maintain our ability to, re to respond in reality by fragmenting of the overwhelm and keeping us, uh, you know, the, our capacities to respond available. Also, when an experience is traumatic, um, it will not depend what, sorry, whether our whether an experience is traumatic will depend on the level of resourcing that the person has access to, to address this overwhelming experience. So for example, those who, people who have privilege, for them, the same experience may not be traumatizing as for those who don't have privilege or who have less privilege. For example, if you break your leg and you have immediate high quality assistance, and you have a family that's there with you and that has the capacity to support you while you heal, that will not be as traumatic as you do not have immediate support 
But if that support is deficient and if you're alone or if you're, the resources of your family are taxed in a way where they do not have the capacity or the, the means to support you as you heal. So even to some that might appear as a normal way of dealing with a medical issue, just getting, you know, good, good attention. And that's just how it is. Um, it really depends on the circumstances that um, and those circumstances will be affected by the types of trauma and the conditions that go beyond your individual circumstances. So let's look now at the different kinds of trauma that we can encounter and um, that, as I was saying, go be beyond the personal and individual. Um, in, the, in the slide, you will see some examples of, of each types of trauma, how they show up. And I will share with you how we are defining them. First of the category that we are basing our understanding of individual trauma. So I'll mention it again, as this is a template for other kinds of trauma. Individual trauma refers to an invisible unhealed wound caused by an overwhelming event, series of events or enduring conditions during our lifetime that remains active in our bodies even long after the event or conditions are over. Examples of these are medical interventions, accidents, abuse, neglect, insecure attachment, among others. When Then we have intergenerational trauma which occurs when one or more of our ancestors experiences trauma that was not dealt with before they had children, and the trauma then gets passed on. The trauma information is encoded in our bodies as sensations, emotions, and reactions, and they get transmitted to the following generations by attachment and relational dynamics in the family, as well as epigenetically, that is through the epigenome, the system in charge of activating or deactivating the functions of our genes. This is to help the descendants survive. For example, if the ancestors experience a fam famine, it lets descendants know that they need to eat more than they would normally. But if the descendants do not live in famine conditions anymore, then this becomes problematic. Examples of this are, you know, suicides, disappearances, migrations and murders, but also adoptions, bankruptcies, jail time or betrayals, among other situations. The following one is collective trauma. Collective trauma can be understood as a population level impacts of a catastrophic event or process, such as natural disasters and wars, that disrupts the basic structures a community or society has created to sustain its way of life. During and after the collectively traumatizing event, the flow of activities in the impacted community is disrupted and resources that we normally have easy access to are unavailable or even destroyed. The results of the experience can be fragmentation, isolation, overwhelm, disorientation, dehumanization, and sometimes even death. The COVID pandemic and climate change are the first global collective traumas humanity has experienced. And as we say, said initially, many people are experiencing right now, experiencing right now the collective trauma of war. A very closely related type of trauma that I believe is very much engaged in why we end up with uh, collective trauma becoming active is historical trauma. Historical trauma can, can be either collective and or intergenerational in nature, but it refers specifically to intentional harm and oppression committed against a group of people attributed to their identity, race, religion, case, etc., but ultimately aimed at subju subjugating them for gain, to exploit them, to take their resources away, or to take over their, their land. Finally, we have systemic trauma. Systemic trauma refers to two conditions. First, the unaddressed leftover impacts of individual, intergenerational, collective, and historical trauma that are present in the system, in the people in the system, and in the different components of the system, plus the fresh trauma that is created by harmful present-day system structures and relational dynamics. I will leave our framing here um, I hope this was helpful. And um, John, I'll hand it over back to you. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I sort of feel like it's it's promising that more people are bringing trauma into their awareness and um, and wanting to have dialogue and discussions about it and do something about it. 
at the same time, it, it is so complex and it is so confusing. So to at least have a little bit of a, you know, perspective on the various different types of trauma uh, and not conflate them all, um, uh, I think is, is helpful. Well, maybe uh, we'll turn it back to um, Tian and, and Gail and, and you, Laura, to just talk about all three of you are doing some really amazing work uh, and have for years done some amazing work uh, to address trauma and, you know, and to sort of bring healing into what you do. So we'd just love to hear some perspectives, some stories from the three of you about, uh, about your work. Maybe Dr. Christopher, I'll start with you. That's Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, John. And Laura, that was so helpful. Thank you very much for that brilliant and concise explanation. Uh, you know, one story that comes to mind dates back to my early years of working in uh, public housing projects in Chicago, uh, where we brought families together. Children, these were mothers of children. The children had been removed from them because of neglect. Now, the child welfare system is legendary for its history of, of racialized removal of Native American children. And not as many people are aware of the fact that the child welfare system, you know, forcibly removes African American children as well. Uh, and most often it's not abuse, most often it was neglect. And of course, we know the social conditions can can create the experiences that you just described where there isn't the energy or the capacity to deliver the kinds of parenting care. Uh, and it, it results in observed neglect and the breaking up of the family. So we put together a program that was called the Family Development Institute, where we brought women together collectively and we supported them and taught them new things about resilience and their own adaptations, their energy production, you know, their collective uh, rituals of love and regard and respect. And the test of our effectiveness was whether the social workers would determine that the parents were functioning well enough to return the children to their homes. You know, so we called it family reunification. And in, in our situation, over 90% of the families were reunified when they had the benefit of this engagement with others and this deepening understanding and actually this love and compassion, you know. Uh, and I have a lot of plaques and things over the years, but the one that touches me the most was from those mothers, you know, and they simply said, thank you for caring. And I think we don't want to lose that critical understanding that as we deepen our understanding of stress and adaptation and trauma and our, as a result, our humanity, hopefully our capacities for compassion and caring and the demonstration of that caring and that empathy, hopefully those capacities will grow exponentially. So that's just one example from many, many decades ago. Yeah, that's so wonderful. And love and compassion and connection and agency. We come back to this, you know, feeling like you have agency. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Ian, what's coming up for you? Oh my gosh, so much comes up. Thank you, Dr. Christopher. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, John. Um, we are such a loving team. We spent all of our time thinking and admiring each other. But um, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna dive in because we have lots of people who are, who are here, and and I'm, I'm hoping are deeply sort of, um, uh, sort of obsessed in the best ways with kind of transformative systems change. But that's what comes to mind is, is the shift from you know, program design to sort of larger landscape change um, when you ask that question, John. And, and for me, it's reflected in a lot of the different portfolios I lead at, um, at Futures. But, but first I'm gonna talk about um, All In For Kids and I'll put links to them in the chat if people want tools and other resources. But um, the All In For Kids platform is a platform that we um, have been leading and convening that's comprised of um, eight different collaboratives. So these are partnerships at the local neighborhood level of cross-sector organizations. You had to have um, had at least an ongoing partnership with at least three other cross-sector um, cross partners in order to uh, be eligible for this source of funding, or they were policy collaboratives. So again, 
you know, partners with at least three other organizations. Um, and they, they serve um, about eight to, eight to 12 different counties in, um, in the Bay Area in California. And we pulled them together because we were keen, as you were saying, John, to sort of really learn about you know, what does it actually take to do transformative systems and policy change? And so we funded them to, you know, organize around prevention. That was sort of criteria number one. Um, and, and from that perspective, sort of multi, multi-familial and intergenerational prevention, so two-gen generation prevention. We, we asked them to really focus their work in um, in, in really unpacking the mechanisms that go into transformative systems change um, and to unpack you know, what it really takes to have a community-led, people-led um, policy agenda and to activate that policy agenda. And we've learned some really amazing things. You know, they have flipped the script in so many ways, you know, from making sure that systems are designed to sort of transform and trans transcend um, trauma and adversity, not just fix symptoms and manage behaviors. I think they're really organized around sort of um, healing and learning what that means from impacted people, not what it means from sort of systems or from insurance panels or even from experts like myself. I think of myself as a, as a clinician and a trauma clinician. Um, and to really think about sort of um, liberation <laughs> as sort of targets for intervention, not conformity. Um, let me give you some examples of that. Um, one that I think about a lot comes from one of the organizations. And again, on the website, you can you can learn about all eight of the eight of the collaboratives that we funded. But they spent their first year, and I, I the year part is really important here, folks, because you know, when you're serious about doing transformative systems change, it requires time and investment and time to do it right and well, right? And so, you know, we gave them that room and space. And in their first year, what they did was they mobilized, like we always should, the impacted people. So, um, you know, 50 to 80 parents within their neighborhoods that were served across these three organizations. Um, and they took that time and they took six months to actually, because this was all happening in the heart of in the height of COVID, but they took six months to really what they called level set. So they um, had the parents come, they had translators in the room for each of the different languages the parents spoke. Um, and they took six months to make sure that parents had access to the technology, that they had access to Mural and Zoom, which were the sort of design technologies that they were using. And they took six months to make sure that every parent in that room not just felt comfortable learning about human-centered design, but felt competent <laughs> learning how to do human-centered design. And once they got that green light, which took them about six months to do, then they dove quick and fast into a design sprint, which they hosted with those parents. And then those parents then hosted small little mini design sprints in their neck of the woods. And they then, pulled all of the insights and the information from that to create a community report card for the local public servants and systems in those communities. Um, and then out of that now, they're thinking about creating an app that would serve very much like a Yelp application, but for the government sector, so that when you're applying for food stands, when you're looking for camps or early childhood care for your kids and for your family, you can rate in real time you know, how your public servants are doing and, and really try to drive and push for constant quality improvement in sort of service as well as options, not just how what is actually being delivered, which is pretty beautiful. One other piece of one of you, um, the one I, I really appreciate too is comes from Young Women's, and that was Meta, Mission Economic Development Agency. I wanna call them out, um, who's leading that work with their partners. Another is the Young Women's Freedom Center, who's working in partnership with, with other partners in the community. And they are an organization that's um, black and brown led by formerly incarcerated women. And their mission is to help survivors who are formerly incarcerated, mothers, especially young mothers, thrive, not just survive and not just reintegrate back into society, but actually find sustainable pathways of economic security 
and mobility and wealth, not just you know financial stability, but wealth for their children. And so um, they recognize that you know to do that, they also have to care for these mothers' physical and mental health. And so they organize what they call a, a wellness and liberation summit, which I love. So they pulled together in the neighborhoods where the women lived, you know, all kinds of healers, indigenous healers, body healers, somatic healers, yoga, Reiki, um, acupuncture. They pulled together traditional therapists, you know, your trauma therapist, um, physical therapist. And they invited these women who they served in the community to come in pairs or in groups of three or four to just basically come to a fair and try on all of these services, you know, so they could go, they could add, ask questions based on their own time. And then they made a list of what resonated for them and what resonated with their spiritual beliefs, with their ethnic, you know, cultural values, with their families uh, sort of schedules. And they, they made um, a vision board based on what it was they needed to really actualize their goals as mothers, most of them single mothers in service, of their children and their family. And then they matched them with coaches to think about how they could navigate the systems, navigate healthcare, navigate the services that they chose um, to come up with a plan that they could sustain and pay for. Um, that John and family, I'm, I'm calling this whole community my family now, um, that, is, that is such a radical shift to what we would call a warm referral, which is the best of what we've been able to do at the systems level right now when you think about, you know, some of the innovations that we're trying to do to, to make relevant service access, accessible to the community. Yeah, thanks. And, and what I also hear is uh, resourcing, where often there isn't the resourcing and resourcing from others in the community as well. Um, I'm going to sprinkle in, if it's okay, with my panelists. Uh, Suzanne uh, Kaufman, do, do you want to read? Your, you want to come off the mic, or do you want me to read the question? Well, sure, I'll come off. Uh, okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you, John, and everyone for this great conversation. I'm interested in hearing your thoughts, your promising practices around how do we heal collectively within the society that continues to prioritize the individual. Great question, and I think many others agree on the chat. Yeah. Well, I'll take a stab at that, and I certainly invite my co-panelists to do so as well. Um, as as they mentioned in my intro, I direct the National Collaborative for Health Equity, and what our primary modality would be communities of practice right now, where we support community activists and leaders, uh, and we bring them together in um long-term experiences, anywhere from 12 months to 18 months, where they work collectively and we apply some of the proven uh, strategies for what we would call collective healing. So, and by supporting them and offering them these tools and resources, they then go back to their own communities and they replicate and do this within their own communities, not dissimilar from what Tien described in the sense that, you know, obviously what my life has taught me in my professional work is that these these groups in you know small groups larger groups but creating communities and supporting those communities and affirming those communities we don't it's a leadership program but we don't call it leadership development because we don't want to imply that they're not fully developed you know uh, these are people who are active on the front lines of social change but we give them this luxury of engagement with one another uh, monetary resources, content, informational resources. And then we invite them to continue to share their learnings and their experiences with one another. So we have about four simultaneous national communities of practice that we're, that we're uh, facilitating. And I use the word facilitate, which we define as to make it easier for for these, for this understanding, for this knowledge, and for this healing to happen, and it, it, we we try to surround them with resources and support. Uh, the book I wrote, RX Racial Healing, it it suggests a process, a circle process of bringing people together, because I think that's one of the tenets, and it's one of the core aspects of most indigenous cultures: bring people together, 
uh, in circle, you know, with food sometimes, but but affirming the humanity of the equal value. I, I'll just end this by saying that, you know, we, des we, meaning humanity at this point, has designed a system that that devalues human beings based on superficial characteristics. And as long as that belief system is allowed to define our systems, we will continue to traumatize and to be traumatized by that lie. And so when we can bring people together for the purpose of eliminating that permission to devalue others and subsequently eliminating permission for violence to be done to one another. I think those are important steps and we have to really have momentum for doing that nationally and globally. And at one level, it seems simple and obvious, right? <laughs> at another level, uh, it's, you know, it's uh, the importance is diminished. Um, so thank you for sharing all of that, Dr. Christopher. Uh, Laura Tien, your thoughts on the question? Ken, please go ahead. Thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, I would I would layer on to what Dr. Christopher put out and say what we've learned in All In For Kids is that um, in addition to sort of, you know, financial resources or fiscal capital, um, we also need what I like to think of as patient or patient's capital, right? Or time, Cap, somebody said it in the chat. Um, this notion of time as a resource is incredibly important and many times systems and organizations and policymakers don't organize around, around the notion of time as a resource that's, that's absolutely necessary to doing this work well, especially if the goal is to unlearn um, and to liberate, um, unlearn sort of harmful behaviors and to liberate people and systems and communities from trauma. Um, I think another set of lessons that we've learned in All In For Kids is that Flexibility is really important too, and a, a learning mindset. Um, meaning, you know, we all go into certain projects with, you know, an idea in mind about when things need to be accomplished and what we're going to do and how we're going to deploy those resources. Um, and it's really critical to give the people who are at the table room to learn, room to make mistakes, room to learn from those mistakes and time and resources to pivot. You know, that example that I gave you from Meta and from the Young Women's Freedom Center, they were able to accomplish that because, you know, as a mediator and as a convener, we weren't on any of our grantees back to sort of, you know, accomplish what they said they were gonna accomplish in their first year. <laughs> you know, we met with them on a, on a monthly basis as a collective and one-on-one -on -one and really prioritize their learning, their discoveries, ask them what they were gonna do differently because of what they're learning and they're discovering and really encourage them to sort of do that. They didn't have to fill in sort of documents and documents of, of, of um, you know, reasons and explanation for why they are shifting their resource distribution or their use of the capital that, you know, that we gave them. Um, definitely making sure that impacted people are at the center of problem frame and solution architecture is also, I think, a must. You know, nobody knows better what works, what helps you to be well and do well in the long run, over time, over your life course, than the people who are living the problems that you're trying to solve. And um, nobody knows how to identify what is necessary. And to also bring to Dr. Gill's point earlier, and, and Laura and John, you mentioned it too, this notion of asset framing, you know, we have to make sure the impact of people, because am I and my parents, we have hopes, people. <laughs> we have hopes, we have dreams. We don't just have goals and pain, right? And, you know, if we're gonna create a system that helps people to thrive, we have to learn what the hopes, not just what the needs and the deficits are of the people who are suffering. Um, and so making sure they're at the table. And then the last thing I'll say is, um, there has to be a real emphasis on uh, leadership um, and leadership that is enabling and that is committed to doing things different operationally. You know, that means how you run your meetings, who you partner with, 
how you make decisions about your resource allocations, um, you know, your hiring, your culture, your climate, you know, all, all of that is um, absolutely necessary and fair play. And you need to have the leaders in place who have the, the heart and the will and the, um, and the community actually, because it's very hard work to kind of figure it out because there are a lot of, there are a lot of barriers that are already cooked into the system now that um, are going to take some time, not going to lie, to sort of undo because those habits of white supremacy are already in there by design. And so it requires, you know, a, a lot of innovation um, to, to, to make change while larger change is, is still slower in coming. Thanks, Tian. I'm going to read, Sandra, it's okay, I'll read your question, um, just to give me time to, for folks to address. Um, the question from Sandra Ortiz is, how to support organizations um, in unlearning to liberate the, of trauma responses? How to start to bring this conversation in decision-making places, for example, boards of big organizations, how to observe with love and compact, compaction our own healing journey? Any mm -hmm. thoughts? Yeah. I, I have some thoughts um, on that. Um, I feel, and this also connects to the question that Andres Felipe was asking about this activism that kind of puts people against the corner to take a stand. Um, and to me, there's a part of this that has to do with, with consciousness, with, with awareness and with inspiration. You know, I was just mentioning before that part of what I am most passionate about is collective intelligence. And when it's through our collective creativity that the invitation comes in, it's like this has been a, a problem that has been entrenched. But, you know, if we look at it from a different lens, you know, a, a transformation can happen that that is not only about um it's not only about our mind seeing things differently within the same frame, but really about evolving our understanding of who we are as human beings. That to me is tremendously exciting. And to me, there's a connection between healing, particularly in the work that I do, healing from colonialism and this evolution that I'm speaking of. And I'd like to share an example of, of an experience I had working with an organization uh, that was an in, um, that had indigenous personnel, uh, an organization that was meant to be serving uh, indigenous population. It was not a really large one, but they were having a lot of issues um, of uh, capacity to collaborate amongst them. You know, and there's this individual mindset. The leader who brought me in to do this work um, told me that she would hear often people saying, "Yeah, that's not my job." So this individual mindset and and, and the fragmentation between them. So. Um, so what we did is we did a, a joint um, meeting with everybody in the team, and um, I shared with them uh, the you know my own experiences of healing from colonialism and how you know the impact that 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 had in terms of my own identity, the sense of shame, the sense of disconnection, and you know how profoundly that had affected me and how much then I would see everything through that lens. And then I did some work with each uh, member of the team individually to address the specific uh, place where they were at in this kind of healing process. By the time that the second meeting came around, there had already been a shift in the whole um, in the whole team. You know, they went from "it's not my job" to "what can I help you with?" And you know, from not liking like now they were going and hanging out even after work. They had become friends. Like there was this whole shift. And in my view, part of where that came from was this revelation that what they were looking through at each other was colonialism and that that's not who they themselves are. And this revelation to me is really about a change in our consciousness. And so trauma work really has this potential to transform who we understand who ourselves to be. Because I thought I was this flawed human being from the you know racist slurs that um, that were thrown at me during my childhood or my my growing years, and you know I had this really compressed sense of who I was, wrong, bad, flawed, and then realizing it, boom, you know, like it it really opened up, and I can see how that happens, and when we can share this conversation and, and have permission to. Um, to explore these together and we find ourselves in, in a safe space, 
then that makes such a difference. So I'd love to hear Tiena and, and Dr. Uh, Gail, what you guys have to say about this. Um, Dr. Christopher, do you want to go? Sure. Uh, I, I'll just quickly say that I, I resonate so beautifully. I was going to say, often it's the intention of a person whose consciousness has embraced with love and compassion the full humanity of themselves and others that creates the the dynamic within an organization for this to happen. And the story that you just shared is such a beautiful illustration of that. Uh, from an organizational standpoint, my experience is that the decision makers within the organization, be it the executive team or the board of directors, needs to have a collective healing experience where they are given a different frame a different lens through which to perceive and view the challenges that they face. In, in my work, it's been, of course, them understanding that, you know, we are one shared human family and that these belief systems that have been imposed, racism and colonialism and sexism and all ableism, that these things get in the way of our ability to show up and be present for and with one another. And I believe very strongly in the basic goodness of humankind and of each other. And so when we invite that, that expression of that humanity and that love uh, within our organizations, you know, and we're honest about the barriers that exist, it, it, gives, it, it invites people to show up without fear of shame and guilt and and you know fragmentation and all the things so that go with trauma and i would just want to acknowledge laura you reminded us so much of what we've done in the name of anti-poverty anti-racism anti-this has actually been traumatizing for many and it has left them feeling insecure and ashamed and afraid and and in some cases paralyzed and so or at least unable to move forward so I think that bringing this understanding of how the body reacts physiologically to these perceived threats, you know, it, it creates environments where we can exhale collectively and we can understand that we're on this journey together as, as extensions of a human family. And to answer the question, I think that's where we begin. And if we do it at first with the with the authorizing people within an organization, if we can, with the board and with the executives, you know, then we we create the opportunity to do it organization wide. So that's just a summary of my experience of this and insights learned. But I, I know Tian and Laura, I know you all have similar or different experiences in answer to the question. That's that's beautiful. I wish we had so much more time. <laughs> I do. Um, but I would just layer on to what my amazing colleagues Laura and Dr. Christopher have laid out there. I couldn't agree more. I do think that, you know, we have to have different organizing principles, which is what I think Laura and Dr. Christopher are talking about. And the ones that are really central in the work that we do at Futures. Um, and on the children's team is organizing around dignity, first of all, um, around community, around participation, around purpose. And, you know, when, when, when systems and practices and portfolios are designed around that, then you're really going to get to enabling power, which is, you know, I think what Laura and Dr. Christopher are talking about as well. And I think I would sum it up by saying I, I, I plus one everything. And what we try to keep in mind is we're constantly developing counter narratives because we have to remember that trauma informed as, as necessary as it is, as an idea, is an yeah. idea that has cooked into the frame of trauma. Like this is the paradox of being trauma. But we need to have trauma informed because the habits of white supremacy were already cooked into the system of response to dealing with trauma. And those same sort of authorizers then shifted the focus to trauma informed. But if we're really gonna do that well, we actually have to tackle that paradox and acknowledge that the habits of white supremacy are cooked into the design of how we do things. And so we believe what we need are counter narratives, alternative practices, which is what Dr. Christopher and Laura are talking about and transformative systems. I'll give one quick example and then yield for conversation. Um, 
Carry the Vision is another one of the um, collaboratives in All In For Care. I, I hope, okay, if you all are there, I love you all. This is like, it's like, you feel like you're picking, I, I have no favorites. This is just what's coming to my mind. But so Carry the Vision is a collaborative. And, you know, what they did was they were going to serve as a fiscal sponsor. They were a white led and owned organization going to serve as a fiscal sponsor to a network of local promotoras um, so that those networks of promotoras could kind of band together and have a pathway for economic mobility. And in doing that, they discovered that even that frame of being a fiscal sponsor um, was not fully undoing the habits of white supremacy in the way that um, in the way that they really wanted to when they when they applied for the for the programming and for the grant. And in collaboration with their network of promotorias, they decided to switch their process in again in the first year, this is all the things that we gave them time to do, to become um, a partner that enables the network of promotoras to be a social enterprise and not to be a fiscal sponsor. And so, you know, two months in, they reached out and said, we want to kind of redeploy, we want to take, we want to give you a new budget. Um, we are going to do sort of new things because we need to bring in these consultants to really provide and then bring in experience to really provide this network of promotoras with the content knowledge and the expert advice that they need to serve as um, a social enterprise, which is which is not very, very easy because many of them were also um, undocumented um, you know, mm -hmm. folks as well. And so we said, sure, yeah, go ahead. And they have been working on this for the last two years and making sort of great strides, really beautiful. They pay their promotors $35 an hour. They've sorted out some real amazing um, sort of innovations to kind of work against some of the system barriers. But one of the things relative to what Laura and Dr. Christopher were laying out is they needed to in this first year, and they did it again and again and again was sort of come together because they said, Tian, as we take on this role, we realized at Carry the Vision, we had to do some you know, work on our own to really think mm -hmm. about how do we run our meetings now that we have this network of promotoras? Where do they fit in? <laughs> you know, the usual meeting structure, the usual board, all you, all what you were saying, Dr. Christopher, don't um, apply anymore. And so we have to kind of redesign everything. Um, and we have mm -hmm. to make room in our, you know, staff meetings to actually create space, as you're saying, Laura, for people to talk about their life experiences, their historical trauma, um, before we sort of just go to an agenda and make decisions. And so they took that year to not only redo their project, but sort of rethink how they want to work and work together with the people that were in their collaborative um, and, and, and continue to do that now. Um, so just to lay that out for you. Thank you. Hey, I'm gonna, Laura, if it's okay, we're, uh, okay. I feel like you guys are just warming up. <laughs> and unfortunately, we have to come to a close. And I thought I'd give each of you a chance to ask uh, a question, which uh, in full transparency uh, came from my uh, colleague, Philippa. Um, and it, I ask it not only, uh, I mean, it's, to me, it's, you know, one of the essences of how we're thinking Collective Change Lab about this, this question of, you know, there's so much opportunity for collective healing. I think often, and this is Philip's question, often the work is done with impacted people to the degree that's done at all. Uh, but you guys, you all have described some great examples. But uh, more often it's done with impacted people, uh, people of a certain identity uh, who've been marginalized in a certain way. How do we work with the whole system and to those with privilege? Um, what are your thoughts on that? And this will have to be uh, probably the closing question um, just to make sure we uh, come out on time. No, I have a few thoughts uh, can go and co can go quickly because I want to hear from uh, Dr. Christopher and Tien on this. Um, to me, a key piece is making things visible, supporting them in being able to see what is, um, you know, and, and part of the challenge is because, you know, collective trauma, for example, is something that's, you, you can't so easily see it or touch it. And so I just want to share very quickly. Um, oh, uh, Tad, if you could allow me to share, please. Um, and I'll just share very briefly what this resource is. 
it's a map of the domains of impact of colonialism that I have used in other moments um, in order to work with precisely to make visible what, um, where, um, oh, sorry, that's not, okay. So I'll just, I'll, I'll post a link later or I'll like get, we'll get you guys a link to that, this. I'm going to write about this, but it's a map that shows how, um, you know, the different aspects of life. So our connection to the sacred, our connection to the earth, our connection to other people, family, community, uh, our connection to ancestry and to our purpose, to, to, um, to creativity. And, you know, I ask people to, um, in the workshops, to go and paste um, um, a marker, where do you see uh, that uh, colonialism has most impacted your community? And then you start to see, for example, in Bolivia, people, there were a lot of impacts in the relationship between men, men and women. And uh, the resources were with the ancestors. In Colombia, um, there, the answers were different. So you could start to see the collective dimension of that. So helping people see that they're, uh, visualize that there is an actual reality to this, I think that's a key, a key component. So I'll leave it there and over to you, uh, Dr. Christopher of Sure, thank you very much. You know, I really believe that the racial healing dynamic that we work with is for all of us. And the definition is to replace this false ideology of a hierarchy of human value with a felt understanding of our interconnectedness and interdependence. And so when we do the racial healing work, it is for the whole community. It is for the both those who might have been seen as the oppressor as well as those who've been impacted by the denial of opportunity. Uh, so when you do a racial healing circle, it, you want to have everybody in the circle, representatives of the whole community, and you facilitate it in a way that, and co-facilitate it because you model the differences in the two facilitators. You model that it is possible to cross these differences and connect at a deeply human level. And so the whole idea of this is that we are bringing the whole community together and systems are simply people and rules and regulations and laws and resources that have been designed by people. And so ultimately systemic change begins with the heart of the people that are involved in the in the systems who have the authority and the power to make the changes. Uh, and so ultimately we will get transformational change in this system of democracy in this country and around the world when we have people who have authority, who are in positions of authority, when they see this as their primary responsibility. And so it's a continuous work to change the hearts, the minds, and experiences of engagement with our true humanity to, to do that at scale all across our different organizations and systems. Thank I you. think. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I'll marry what Laura and Dr. Christopher um, said around, you know, this, this, this heartfelt change and making things visible and double down on um, storytelling and how you sort of tell the story and you know for us on um, the children's team at Futures and in All In For Kids John we rely quite a bit on the framework that you and your colleagues have have put out um, called the, the water for systems change right um, and the six conditions that are there and so we really try to make visible and demonstrable um, and learnable and teachable <laughs> Um, and doable, um, what those mindset shifts are. Um, we really try to tell a lot of stories like we've done today, like I hope I've been able to do today about what it looks like when relationships are centered and um, how power dynamics get shifted and what it takes. Um, and then lastly, we try to sort of drive upwards to, okay, if if we have those mindset shifts, if we start first with the deep <laughs> and then we go to kind of the relational, and the shifts in power, then we can talk more clearly about, as Dr. Christopher is saying, the actual tangible, you know, explicit changes in practice, policies, and resource distribution that actually could become, you know, um, scaled 
at the population level. Um, but but only if we start first, you know, with the deep. And I I firmly believe that, you know, there are people, as Dr. Christopher and Laura has said, who are who serve as authorizers in the ecosystem and 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 who have, you know, an interest and 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 the heart to kind of do this well. And I'll give one quick story. My mom's a survivor of domestic violence and also Vietnamese, as you, as I, I know you've heard, but after my father took his own life, after he tried to kill her, you know, she went to work. Um, she was the only woman at an engineer in, a, in, in an electricity plant down in North Carolina. And, you know, her colleagues there used to drape the communist Vietnamese flag over her desk if she came in late. Um, when she was trying to go to school, she would study during her work hours or lunch hours and they complained and she got reprimanded even though she was studying on her work hours. And so she'd go out into the car and study in her car in the parking lot. But, you know, what helped her and therefore helped us, because if you want to help children who are impacted by violence and trauma, you have to help their, their parents, right? And their community people. But what helped her was a man, a colleague um, named Jim. Um, and he, um, I'll never forget him. He would take her out to lunch from time to time, um, would remove the flag, um, would have us over to their house for lunch, and eventually invited us into their church. And we, we all became Southern Baptists for a while, y'all, true story. <laughs> I'm good to that there was a moment in my life because of this man, and because of, you know, what he, and he was an authorizer, right? Um, I firmly believe that there are many Jimmies out there um, who are authorizers, um, who are ready, and who have privilege, and who are ready in community to partner like us. We just need to kind of open up more conversations like this and, you know, and say there are half of America's children have ACEs, you know, those children are students. <laughs> One in six adults have ACEs. Those children are students, they're workers, employees, they're college students, right? They're patients, um, they're athletes. Everybody has a role to play here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, TM. Mm -hmm. That amazing story. Well, yeah, I, you know, I just want to thank all three of you for the wisdom, the courage bravery, um, the insights that you have shared. Um, for my part, I, I so resonate with many of these perspectives and the fact that, uh, you know, I think if there's one thing, you know, we are a society that's starved for intimacy. Mm -hmm. And I, I really do resonate with the fact that a lot of this is reconnecting with our humanity and reconnecting with our hearts. And that... We, I could go on and on about the circle. I think if there's a saving grace for the world, uh, it's the circle. But that's another conversation to be continued. I will just close this out by saying just a few things. One is if somebody could drop in the chat, we have two more webinars coming up uh, on December 11th and December 15th. And I think hopefully those will come up and I really encourage you to sign up for those amazing group of people uh, for those. Uh, we, the Collective Change Lab have a, article that'll be coming out in Stanford Social Innovation Review sometime toward the end of this month or the first of the year. It's on collective uh, healing for systems change uh, and sort of goes into depth in this, this whole area of systemic trauma. Um, and the last thing is just, you know, in addition to thanking all of our incredible panelists, and just thank all of you for tuning in and, uh, you know, being part of what we hope will be a, a growing movement of people who are putting trauma and healing at the center of uh, social change work. Thank you all. This has really been wonderful. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. It's beautiful to have you here.